Hey, what's going on, everyone? Welcome to episode two of the Former Action Guys podcast. I'm your host, Justin Kramer. Uh, today's podcast, we're going to finish up our interview with Camino Emil. But before that, we're going to do a little bit of administrative stuff. So I got some feedback. I, I said 2nd Battalion, 7th Marines were in singing before 3 5. That was incorrect on the last show. I said that. There was actually 3rd Battalion, 7th Marines that was there, and then 3 5, 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines relieved them. So. That was a mistake on my part. Also, excuse the last 30 seconds of the previous podcast. Um, there was some overlap in some audio. That was a mistake on my end. I'll try to make sure that doesn't happen again. So, yeah, we're all human, and this is my first time doing something like this. So, here we go. So, anyway, um, let's go ahead and push off to Camino Emil. And, uh, oh, real quick, if you do have any more feedback for me, Feel free to hit me up, former action guys podcast at gmail.com. Again, that's former action guys podcast at gmail.com. Or you can hit me up on my Instagram, J Kramer Graphics. So without further ado, here is the second part of our interview with Camino Emil. How did you get hooked up with our advisor team then? How did that happen? Okay, so uh, orders came out to Davis, so my chief at the time. And they were so it was basically like a like I guess like division wide orders, and they were asking for an E five with at least two combat deployments. Um, and now I don't think I think that was just like a blanket thing for uh, what's it called for the advisor teams. So they were asking for uh, an E five with two combat deployments, and at the time I was an E four, so I was like, hey, like uh, Davis was like, this came down, this email came down. It's not an, it's an E five billet, but I could try to swing something. So at the time I, I had like a purple heart, uh, man with a V. I had just gotten back from my second appointment and Davis was like, I can, I think he said, I don't know if Davis said he knew the, the, what's it called? If he knew the person who sent out the email, but he was like, I can try to, what's it called? Uh, see if they, if they'll take you. And then obviously, yeah, they took everyone at that point, but <laughs> what's it called? Uh, I opted for it ended up getting it which was like were you like oh shit i'm going back (laughs) well no so like davis was like yeah it's kind of like a shot in the dark type of thing like i don't know if you're gonna get this and i was like all right so fucking continue doing like our training or like a pre-deployment training for uh two eight and then i want to say like fucking like maybe like two or three weeks later they were like hey uh you got picked up and then it was like show up at what what was it marshall not marshall what's that uh where, where was heroes again I have no idea. Heroes Bar at a it was it was near a, what's it called the one by the traffic circle. Yeah, yeah. What was the name of that place? Because that's where we all met up to like where uh, they we were had like, like a breakfast or something. Well, together. Yeah, no, it was like this is where you get to meet your team. Yeah, it was and super I, not military. It yeah, was like it was we all awkward, sat down. Dude. Like it was like being in high school. It's like, it was right, stand up, say your name, and uh, what you've done. Yeah, and it was dude. It was super weird, and they were like because everyone got there and no one knew where the fuck they were going. I mean, I was like, hey, like my name is H and Three Emil, and I'm supposed to go to. Then I pulled up my paper and I was like. S F A A T and then and then there's a shit ton of numbers and I was like, Do you guys know where this is? <laughs> They're like, Oh yeah, you're gonna go with that group. And uh and so like at the time, like I didn't know none of us knew where we were going up until uh so this is what I remember vi- vividly is that <laughs> uh the major had like pulled this all, all in together and I think did, did he have a GRG of like Fob Jackson? Oh, I don't know, I don't remember that. I think he had like a map or not a map, but he had something where it was like a he had like a list or whatever, and he was like, "Does anyone know where Fob Jackson is?" And I remember being like, there's, "Unless there's more than one Fob Jackson, like that's." I remember thinking in my head, "There's just more than one Fob Jackson, like that's the Sangha Valley." And he was like, "And he was like, yeah." So like, we're we're going to the Sangha Valley, and I was in my head, I was like, "This is this is how I die." Like, there's, there's no, no fucking way. way. Are you mind going back for a third time <laughs> Dude, to the Sangha Valley? Most was, guys don't don't even want to go once that know the history of it. Well, alone. I, I mean, even when I was going to one six, I didn't know I was going to the Sangha Valley until I got to Camp Dwyer. And they were oh like, no way, not, yeah. They were like, well, like I said, like the combat placement for one six, I thought I was going with one six Charlie, and they were down in Marja, so. For even for this one, I was like, honestly, had I known that I was going back to the Sangha Valley, I probably wouldn't have volunteered for it. But just because I didn't want to like push my luck, right? Yeah, definitely. Uh, But I mean, so like, he was like going to the Sangha Valley, and I was like, fuck it, like already here. So, uh, but like with that being said, like I thoroughly enjoyed like the training package they had for us for the most part. Um, Yeah, there was some stupid stuff, but yeah, there was. (laughs) I think we had a good team of guys. Um, We had three corpsmen. So we had you, we had HM3 short, yeah, HM3 short, three short and then HM2 Wyatt. Wyatt. And uh, HM2 Wyatt had previously served in Fallujah 
and 04. He was yeah. there during that whole thing. So he obviously had some real world combat experience and moved from that to uh, biomedical device. Maintenance yeah, he was a he deal. was a biomed tech. So he was that was a, it's a I think it's its own separate MOS or NEC. I think is what they call it. But uh, no, actually, it's what they call it. So Navy enlisted code or whatever. Um, yeah. So, but Wyatt had combat experience. He had done the whole trauma thing or T triple C thing. So that was good. And then short, but they both came from like, it was like weird where it was like, it was an infantry advisor team. So coming into that unit, I thought it was just going to be like inf- Corman from the infantry. Um, and then it was like, and then you saw short well, and doc short, doc short came from dental battalion, <laughs> which did, like, so short coming in was like, I was just like, what is, what is this? Like, what are we like how did this happen but like short was a good dude like i like working with him was he he was very pleasant i have no no he he was you know he was very uh i think he he understood that he was short on the knowledge that he needed to know yeah and he seemed like he was very good about studying yeah asking questions he was so the the thing i liked about short was that like he he, took it seriously he did he took it seriously and it wasn't like he so i think what some corpsmen have some issues with is kind of, or not, I think just people in like a, the warfighting community in general is that like they're, they, uh, it's super hard for them to swallow their ego and then be like, I need to know, you know, I need to learn something. Short wasn't like that, right? Short knew that he, he had like a decent amount to learn and he was all about learning it. So no, that's I, good. Yeah. And that's what I thoroughly enjoyed about working with him. I kind of, so. You know, and this is where I can pick up and add more to the conversation because oh, yeah. we did this together. Um, so from from my part of this, I had just gotten back. I had gotten back from Afghanistan with three six as the fires chief. Uh, we got home January first, actually two thousand two thousand twelve. Because uh, I remember we uh, we got stuck in Ireland and we watched Big Ben strike midnight on TV while we were drinking Guinness in Ireland. Dude, that's pretty sick. Coming back, yeah. That's so that was cool. Sick. But I got back and they were like, hey, uh, you want to go to TCP school? And I'm like, fuck yeah. Like, of course I do. Like, yeah. Dude. So I chopped from 3.6 early so I could go through the primer course. And then I got sent to TCP school, which is where you go to get qualified as a JTAC. And then came back from there. And at the time, JTACs, I mean, at the time, it's always the same. But JTACs are always shorthanded. But at the time, I think they were really shorthanded. And I didn't even do like a full... I did a couple controls in the fleet. Like I did a couple yeah. missions, you know, in training and they were like, all right, go forth and be a JTAC, you know? Jesus. And I was at the Marsoc fires class. They had sent me over to, to the Marsoc fires class to um, just sit through that. And at the end of it, they were like, Hey, what, who are you? Why are you here again? I'm like, I don't know. They just told me to come to this class. They're like, Oh, you're probably deploying with us then. Cause they yeah. had a deployment coming up and okay, the major, okay, the yeah. major there was like, yeah, you're probably coming out with us. That's the only reason you'd be here. And I'm like, sick. Like I'm going <laughs> to yeah. go, I'm going to go out with Mars. Yeah. Hell yeah. And, and then my major from 10th Marines, the air officer calls me and he's like, Hey, you got orders. You need to go down to meth and pick up your orders. And I'm like, Oh shit. Like I'm going to get my orders from Mars. And then yeah. I'm like, well, Mars doesn't fall under, meth yeah, like like two meth so i go i go down to meth and i get it and same thing i'm like what's s-f-a-a-t <laughs> yeah. like what is this uh, wait did you call the number because on the email there was a number to like like a staff nco no i called it it's a number to nothing <laughs> <laughs> which is what you got yeah yeah so uh, so i thought i was going out with those guys and i found out you know i met up with you guys and we yeah. all did our intros and stuff like that and when they were like hey you're going singing I'm like, oh fuck, because I knew the history of singing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, any if you didn't know about singing at that time, you know, I don't want to say you're a piece of shit, but you kind of were a piece of shit. You were oblivious to what's going on in the oh, world yeah. because it especially was major, in the, especially in the Marine Corps. Like, the fucking singing was huge. Yeah, that's what I mean. I don't mean like general people. Oh, yeah, I mean, like, I mean like Marines. Yeah. If you didn't know what singing was, because three five had been actively taking casualties like yeah. crazy at that, you know, so it, it had a history, and I knew that history, and I can identify with short. Because at this point, I was Sergeant Kramer. You know, I came in the Marine Corps as Motor T and LAP moved in 2009 and then went to MOS school for Ford Observer 2010 and then did my deployment in 2011 with 3.6. So I had been, you know, an FO for what, two years. And then they're like, okay, now you're going to go be a JTAC. And then I, ba- I got almost no, no training and got to the team and i will say that 
my biggest uh, my biggest critique of our training was that there was zero zero training for JTACs, zero training for fire support people, um, and there wasn't even opportunities to cross train. Like, you know, and I was it. Like, there when you go on an advisor team, you're the JTAC. Like, yeah, there's no air officer to lean on. There's no other JTACs to lean on because we need to deploy with a battalion. You usually, have your air officer, assistant air officer, then multiple JTACs. So all those guys kind of hang out, learn from each other. And they can all help each other be successful. We didn't really have that. So I came there thinking, I have no idea what the fuck I'm doing. Yeah. Like I'm. And then I'm you're, you're also the only one there without another counterpart too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I was one of one. So I had, and when, uh, what was it? Gunny Suleiman. Yeah. Or our yeah. team, team, team Gunny or team Steph team Gunny, CEO, right. or Steph and CIC, what do you want to call him? He, he's like, Hey, you're the J tech. And I'm like, yeah, he's like, you're the only one. You're going to be fucking busy, bro. And I'm like, yeah, I know. Like, here we go. But I can identify with short because I felt like I didn't know enough and I didn't want to be the reason that something bad happened. Yeah. So yeah. I was always in my books. I was in the pubs reading, you know, I was reading everything I could. I was, if I could find someone to talk to about it, I would talk to people about it. And, you know, it's just nervous when you're coming from, Something completely, not completely different. I mean, it's kind of the same, but like you said, I was one of one, so I yeah. couldn't, I could mm-hmm. not perform. Exactly. Um, so anyway, so we got our advisor training going. Um, we went through a bunch of stuff. We went out to ATG, which is out in 29 Palms, which is kind of like the EMV for advisors, where you go out and do a bunch of one-on-one with fake local nationals and you yeah. do little missions and stuff Honestly, like that. Honestly, it was a pretty, I, uh, with the exception of like some like training, it was, it, the actual training package wasn't that bad, especially the advisor part. No, the I, the advisor training was great. I thought yeah. it was good. I thought the role players were really good. Yeah. Um, I just like I said, my my big complaint was there was no fires training. There was no there oh, was no yeah, training yeah. for me as a JTAC to make myself better. Uh, and this this would be crazy to say, but from TACP school, from the time I became a JTAC, the first time I ever saw a live bomb go off was in Afghanistan. That's fucking insane. That's insane, right? That I did. I'm a JTAC. I'm in charge of doing this. And I have never even, because I went to TCP school on the East Coast. And on the East Coast, the ranges over there are way more restrictive than they are on the West Coast. So when you go out to do your certification controls and stuff, you're dropping, they're dropping 25 pound concrete bombs, you know, that are just marking. That way you can see, okay, I hit it. But I didn't fully understand the effects of the weapons until I got to Afghanistan. And, you know, they started dropping. (laughs) <laughs> jdams yeah. and stuff and we're like oh shit you know it's a pretty steep learning curve dude so um so anyway so so me and cam we uh we did the workup we did atg we finished that team got together we were all broken down i was the team jtac um we had we had three tulai or afghan company advisor teams yeah. built into our team we had a headquarters element how many guys we have 17 19 19 yeah. okay I always get those mixed up. My Anglico team was the other. 17. I just remember 19 because that was, what's it called? I remember how many medical records I had to bring with me to Afghanistan. <laughs> so you were on, what team were you on? I was, uh, what's it called? Uh, Fox. So I was Captain Falvey's team. Okay. So he was just Captain Falvey. It was you, Captain Falvey. Uh, it was Sergeant literally Fo- all the Fs. It was Captain Sergeant Falvey. Sergeant Fosberg. Corporal Farrow. And Corporal Sar- Farrow. Sergeant Vosberg was an infantryman. This was his third deployment also. Yeah. Corporal Farrell was the radio operator. This was his first deployment. First deployment. And Captain Falvey was an infantry officer. And this was... Was this his second deployment? Yeah, it was his second deployment. Okay. Because he was a 3-6 for his first. No, I don't think... Did he deploy with 3-6? He did. On that? Yeah, he, he, he deployed with Oh, I thought, he got, I thought he attached a 3-6 after we had gotten back. No, no. He, he went to 3-6. Uh, he was on that deployment with 3-6. Oh, okay. Well, anyway, so your team had a pretty decent amount of experience. So, And we were broken up, so each advisor, each mini-advisor team had a different fob that they were in charge of. So when we would go out to work with our Afghan partners, um, that team would be the focus. So when we would go there, if you weren't actively like engaged with the Afghans, you were on security element, you were doing guardian angel work or you were radio watch or something like that. Um, being the only JTAC every time we went out or every time anybody went out, I went out. Um, I think one time the major made me stay back because he said I was too dehydrated <laughs> and I was so pissed. I was super pissed. I was yelling. I was like, yeah, this is bullshit. Something's <laughs> going to happen and I won't be there. Like, um, but when we got to, when we got to Afghanistan, um, when we first got there, I remember we, 
we were landing or we were flying in on 53s. I had fallen asleep and something set off the uh, flare devices on the 53 and it popped flares. <laughs> and I remember like waking up and my my head was next to like one of the glass windows yeah. next to the bird. So out of the corner of my eye, I just see this bright flash and like the, the loud noise of that flare popping, yeah. you know, and I'm coming awake. So I'm thinking we just got shot down. <laughs> I'm like, oh, shit. And then I'm like, oh, wait, hold on. We're good. Yeah, we're so then we land. The other advisor team was super pumped to see us. They were ready to get out of Jackson. Yeah. And um, we land, we get off, we, you know, put all our stuff where we're going and stuff. And that night, that first night, I remember we were outside grilling steaks and there was <laughs> tracer fire flying Coming over through, the camp. Yeah. And it was just like, we're listening to music and grilling steaks. <laughs> and you got tracers flying over. We're just like, what the fuck? <laughs> And, you know, talking to their guys, they're like, yeah, it's been pretty quiet because they had the winter deployment. Yeah. Um, they had recently done an operation that was... Pretty, they did a pretty big one. It was up in Kajaki. Up in Kajaki. Yeah. yeah the JTAC was telling me they had two of their two of the advisors that had um, bullet holes in their packs because they were wearing their rucks because they were supposed to be up oh, there yeah. for a little bit. And as they were coming off the helicopter, the Taliban dudes had uh, no shit machine gun positions dug into the ground Jesus. in the cornfield. So they couldn't really see them. And they were coming off, taking machine gun fire and just immediately hitting the deck. And some of these guys had holes in their packs That's where insane. the rounds were flying right over and hitting their packs. And I think that was from the way he made it sound. I think that was like the only real action that like major action that they dealt with on their deployment. He said it was pretty quiet. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, we get there and we're thinking like, OK, this isn't, you know, tracer fire flying over the camp. They were shooting. It was a Taliban shooting at AUP positions right outside of our uh, right outside of the fob. And I think we were there for about a month and it was pretty quiet. You know, we were running to the fobs and stuff like that. And we're like, okay, this isn't too bad. Yeah. Then, then the Taliban brought, you know, they announced, they're like, Hey, the fighting season has begun, you know, cause they do that <laughs> yeah, every year, do, yeah. every spring. They're like, Hey, the fighting season's officially begun. And it was like completely different after yeah, it was that. Just like it was, even when we weren't pushing out, it was like casualties just coming in. The first time I remember the first time we went out after the fighting season had begun, that was that time that they had uh and I don't know if you were I don't know if you were on this mission or not, but I want to say you were. We were doing a census patrol. We were yeah. well, we it wasn't a patrol, we were it was a mounted movement north on six eleven. Uh, I don't remember the area that we stopped, but we pulled over an area, set up a uh, vehicle checkpoint and started TCP. Yeah. Started, started doing the uh, census, um, information gathering and stuff. Well, on our way up, there was a dump truck. Oh yeah. yeah. We were up there. It was overturned. And they had, uh, what's it called? They had, what's it called? The, uh, the gunshots through the windows. Yeah. So, yeah, dude. <clears throat> so at this time, the government, because Sangin was just so bad with IED, six eleven was the main route. And you could, you know, up to this point, you couldn't really drive down that without, really concerned about being blown up because yeah. the entire route was dirt. Um, so we had been paying to have local nationals and these contractors come in and pave the road up yeah. 611. They were I'm, planning on paving it from Helmand all the way to up Kajaki. to Kajaki. And the point was, one, to mitigate IEDs, but two, I think it was also so they could bring the turbine up yeah, to they fix were the Kajaki to, dam. So that was the whole idea was them trying to, what's it called, to fix the Kajaki Dam. They were trying to fix the Kajaki Dam and bring electricity to that whole area because that's what was, like, keeping the area from having a solid electricity. And um, so we're going up. We're going up north on Route 611. And there's this, there's this dump truck flipped on its side with bullet holes in the window. And we're like, what the hell? Dude, and then we, was... then we take a couple pot shots yeah. from the right, from our that would be from the east. And... When, the major's like, I think, I think the major was on that one. He's like, Hey, push through. So we went around that yeah. vehicle, kept going. And then they had like a, I remember past that they had a, what's it called? Was it an ALP position? There was, yeah, there was like a small patrol base or something like that yeah. because I think the major and someone else got out of the vehicle yeah. and made sure they were all good. And, um, they had said that the Taliban dudes that were coming in and they killed the contractors that were driving the dump truck and hit it with an RPG it's laying on its side. They were trying to block the road and keep us from moving that way. And also to uh, keep people from wanting to come up there and build this road. Yeah. So we push past that one. They stop and get out, ask the ALP dudes or whoever they were, if they were good. Uh, they were got back in the truck. I think we took a couple more pot shots at that point. And then we came up to another dump truck that was flipped over. There was two. There yeah. was two and we're like, holy shit. Dude, dude. I, in all honesty, like that entire movement up, my fucking asshole was just puckered up oh yeah i know i was like oh man dude like there something's about to yeah. happen because this is like straight up like we're 
especially when we were in between Moving the two forward, dump yeah, trucks. Like we are, we could get blocked in here very yeah. easily and just. It's, and be especially because like uh, over towards the brown zone on that side, I think they had. Especially moving past the first one, it was kind of an elevated position. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah, they were up to the on the east side in the brown zone, and it was definitely up higher. Um, especially for for especially because like the gunners on top, like Foz and Linden, like they're in a pretty exposed position for for them especially. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah as the gunners for sure. And I think that was the start where we're like, oh man, things are different. And after that, after that, it just became fighting you know like um the taliban took over like seven of the afghan yeah, patrol so bases one of the things that all in one night it was like yeah. one night one big operation so we went up to uh P- or fob topak which was old for those of you guys who have been to the saying valley before fob topak is old fob alcatraz so that was like higher uh it was like higher headquarters for like one six alpha um second recon was out there um, yeah they're the ones that built it yeah so, so it was old Fob Alcatraz and like, I, that was always like one of the things that fucking stuck with me as far as me, like, so fought, so like, that's like one of the crazier things like fought in F or so fought in the second Valley, like a year, like a year before that fucking second deployment seemed to like, it like seemed like security was starting to get better. And then just to watch them burn all the old PBs that fucking one six, uh, alpha and Bravo had set up going into there. I was just like, dude, what the fuck is going on? And then so like that was one of the things like I never really understood about the <laughs> their whole idea of like uh what is it? Mutually supported uh what's it called positions. Yeah. Where they would get shot at and then fucking empty out a patrol base and then go support them and then come back and then it'd be backlaid by IEDs. Like, yeah. are you fucking retarded? Yeah. I mean, what are you gonna do? Dude, kind I, of I think that that I never understood. It was just like uh, so like p- part of the reason why they lost most of those patrol bases in those positions was that like uh the ANA positions would rec- uh, would request QRF and then the ANA from like let's say like a mutually supported position or another like mutually supported position would virtually empty out their patrol base send all their guys to the the uh, what's it called the PB that needed the That's QRF the first, yeah. and then the Taliban would just fucking w- virtually like wipe out and backlay the old position yeah, I mean, <clears throat> um, I don't think people realize, you know, people hate on the A and A and stuff like that, and for some re- good reasons. I, yeah. I would say there's there's good and bad soldiers. I think I think as an advisor, I think that was one of my biggest eye opening things is working with some of the guys and realize some of those dudes are straight patriots. Some yeah. of those dudes want to be there, they want to make their country better, and I they want to the, fight. The and biggest one was the sergeant major. Their sergeant, sergeant major. major Hassan. Yeah, dude. I, I got a story about him, yeah. um, <laughs> but some of the guys, you know, some of the guys were garbage and stuff like that, but these dudes are getting killed all the time. It's not like us where we're like, oh shit, we're deploying, go to Afghanistan yeah. for seven months, they come were. home for like a year or whatever, and then prep and go back. They're, they, they're, they're there. They live yeah. there. You know, that's their home and, you know, they're not from the Sangin Valley necessarily, but, you know, they're, they're always in Afghanistan. Yeah. And... <clears throat> They they took a ton of casualties. They I guess is what I'm kind of getting at is people don't realize the amount of casualties they took and how that could have affected their morale, which is be why some dudes were you know what we thought were any good. Some of these guys just wanted some. A lot of them didn't want to leave the army necessarily, but they did want to leave the Sangin Valley. Yeah. You know, there were guys that had been in Sangin for two years. You know, yeah. that had been at the FOB the entire time. And the fighting there just got crazy. And in 2013, when we were there, the Taliban were making a uh, um, a very deliberate offensive to come through and try to disrupt stuff because we were the last advisor team in that area and then we were going to be pulling out. So they wanted to come through and mess stuff up before we, we got out of there. Yeah. And I remember we were on one of the most memorable fights we were in. We were at Shamsher Du and they were firing at us from the tree line to the south. Yeah, from the south. And it's the same one that we always yeah, was, took contact from. Yeah. And... While we were there, we had gotten there. There was an Afghan mission going on to include the company commander and like a platoon of guys were out. Yeah. And we pulled in and it was just mayhem. Like six of their dudes got killed that I mean, day, including, including the platoon commander. Yeah, including their company commander, commander yeah. was killed that day. Um, <clears throat> I remember 
they were that was the time combat camera was out there with us yeah. that was his first time coming out with us and i remember going down he was down there was a group of guys getting ready to go out as a qrf to try to rescue their dudes and he was going down taking photos of them and stuff and this is the afghans and he's down there by himself so i'm like all right i'm gonna walk down there just to you know guardian angel yeah. kind of make there's a, you always want to have an extra guy there. You know, this is all during the blue or green on blue and stuff like that incidents, stuff like that. So I, I went down there and there was an Afghan soldier carrying an RPG and he had an RPG and a 203. He had an M4 or not M4, but an M16 with a 203, 203 on yeah. it. And he's like, Hey, 203, I need grenades. And I'm like, dude, I don't have it. I don't even have a 203. Yeah. <laughs> like my rifle doesn't have one. And obviously combat camera didn't, yeah, but did he you? kept asking us. He was like, Hey, we need grenades. I need grenades. I need grenades. And uh, wait, like it, grenades are like forty mic mic. Yeah, the forty millimeter okay, grenades okay. for the for the two hundred three. Okay. Uh, so that yeah, for those who don't know, that's the grenade launcher that's mounted underneath your M four rifle or M sixteen. And and we didn't think anything of it. Well, these guys push out, man, and they weren't even to the tree line, and, then, and they yeah. were started taking casualties and were pinned down. And I know it really affected that combat camera guy. Cause we came back and, or they came back and the, the linguist, I was talking to the linguist. I was like, Hey, what's up? You know, we were talking, he's like, Hey, you remember that guy that was asking about grenade drilling? We're like, yeah. He's like, yeah, he just got killed. And Jesus. the combat camera guy was standing there and you could tell he was like, what? Like, I was like, dude, that's just how it is, man. Like yeah. there's nothing. Don't, I told him, I'm like, don't think about it, man. Like it's nothing us giving him. Cause he felt bad. Cause he was asking for grenades. Yeah, he's yeah, like, well, what if yeah. that would have, and I was like, you can't even yeah. like, don't go through what ifs or you're going to, you're going to drive yourself crazy. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I mean that was a pretty that was a pretty serious firefight. That was the one too where the Afghans, our Afghan National Army guys were shooting off that SPG nine, the yeah, recoilless dude. rifle, which is was miserable for us because they wouldn't tell us when they would do it, or they'd be like, Hey, we're gonna shoot it. So yeah. we all get down and we'd wait for like five minutes, like what wouldn't. are they doing? And then we'd get up and then and then they would shoot. Yeah, you'd stand up like, What are you guys doing? Then <laughs> boom. So the anticipation yeah. was just horrible. And then we had that guy that was trying to tell us that there was Taliban in the compound on the other side of the yeah. fob. He's like, Hey, I need uh he was like, Hey, shoot a grenade into this compound and we're like, Why? And he's like, There's Taliban, there's Taliban in there. And we're like, we're dude, like, we're dude. we didn't see anybody go in there. We're we're not gonna shoot a grenade into the compound. So I think part of the so this is one of the thing I never really understood. part of the reason why I think James should do was always under fucking perpetual attack. Anytime they took contact, they lobbed fucking mortars into the closest village. Yeah, I mean they were surrounded by it. There was buildings. Yeah, dude. They fucking would just lob mortars. Yeah, I, I, yeah. Every single well, so time. this guy, this guy, yeah, they would just, they would do, they would just shoot. They'd be like, we only have 60 mortars. We can't do this. Yeah. And then they would start shooting. <laughs> Instead of shooting at legitimate targets that they we were trying just... to tell them to shoot at, they would just start popping <laughs> rounds off at nothing. Um, but this guy was like, hey, there's Taliban in here. And we're like, dude, we're not shooting a grenade into that until we see yeah. the enemy. And that's when he was like, well, he told the linguist, he's like, if, if the Americans aren't going to help us, we're going to kill you and the Americans. And the linguist yeah, came over and told us that. What was his name? Do you remember? The, uh, dear, the little dude, the tiger team guy. Uh, oh, uh, Zap. 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 Yeah. Zap. So we gave Zap, the linguist, a pistol. Yeah. We're like, Zap, here's your pistol now. Like, take this pistol and keep every, keep your eye on that dude. Because yeah. now we're like, what the hell? We got. We're all up on the roof. like fucking... and In the guy's defense, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> six of their dudes had just gotten killed. Yeah. And they expected that the Americans were going to come in and that we were going to bring in, you know, hell and fury on the enemy. But unfortunately, at that time was the thinking was that, yeah, we were there. We were the advisors and we're there to support them. But every means necessary had to be used by the Afghan National Army before they'd bring in American assets, unless it was um, especially like a medevac. They wouldn't even medevac guys unless it was life, limb or eyesight. Yeah. Um, so. We were kind of limited on what we could do for them, and they weren't very happy about it. And like I said, he apologized later. I remember he apologized. <laughs> and and we watched that building because we're like, if someone's in there, we're, I yeah. mean, we'll definitely shoot it. We watched that building, and a woman came out with like three kids. Which... And that's the only people we saw come in and out of that building. So I was like, that's why we don't just fucking shoot at buildings, man. Yeah. And um, yeah, so that was one firefight that I'll remember just because so many dudes were killed. And I mean... That dude saying he's going to kill us. And Zap was talking shit to the Taliban on the <laughs> radio. On the radio, yeah. <laughs> this our linguist. You know, he was a good dude. He was a Tiger Team guy before. Um, he became a linguist to earn more money. But he would, you know, the Taliban dudes are using regular walkie-talkies, basically. Like, high, yeah, longer so range like, walkie-talkies. I, I chatter, he picks, he picks it up on ICOM chatter, and he could just fucking 
basically. So that was like one of the reasons why the also the the ANA in that area were upset because they were trying to recover their platoon commander's body. Um, and then I remember specifically that uh, basically the insurgents in the area, one of their captains or whatever was like taught like on on fucking like two way radios basically, and I think they know that we can pick up their their chatter, but on two way radios like talking about like uh what's it called like uh, like mutilating like the platoon commander's body basically yeah so i think that was one of the reasons they were also like just like super upset but i mean rightfully so yeah oh well, yeah for sure yeah no reason to threaten us i mean we're there no, to help yeah. but i yeah. i can I, under, I completely understand the first sergeant kind of the first sergeant at that pb the ana first sergeant at that pb up until that point had been Super nice guy, super yeah. welcoming and stuff like that. And then I think it, our our relationship with him kind of changed after that because he was – they wanted me to – I remember they wanted me to get aircraft in. So I finally got – he was like, hey, we need aircraft, we need aircraft. But they were shooting mortars and they were shooting that SPG-9. And I told him, I'm like, I can't bring helicopters here until you do stop, stop yeah. shooting the mortars. And we were going back and forth and I had air scheduled already. I'm like, air is, my air is supposed to check on at this time. Like, I need you to stop shooting the mortars. And he's like, no, we got people dying out there. And I'm like, I got it, dude. I got it. But yeah. I can't help you with air unless you stop because I don't know where you're shooting. Your dudes are just kind of popping rounds off everywhere. So he stops his guys from shooting the mortars. And then I get on the radio and I'm like, hey, say status of my aircraft. And they're like, hey, they're delayed 30 minutes. And this is after I'm going back and forth and arguing with this first sergeant. He's super emotional and he doesn't want to stop firing mortars. And I basically make him stop so I can bring in support. Then I have to turn around and go, hey, man, sorry, the aircraft's not coming. You guys can keep shooting mortars. Jesus. And I was just like, dude, it's rough, man. You know, yeah. how how would you compare? OK, so how would you compare the activity from that third deployment to your first and second? Obviously, your first one was limited in scope, but your second deployment. Uh, activity was so I think one of the things that kind of set this one up a little bit differently was that we were working in such a smaller team. Yeah. Um, we also weren't the, so the ANA presence in the area was, they didn't have a presence, right? They barely push out local security patrols. They didn't actually, they didn't really push out local security. They kind of patrols. moved back to how like the British were doing it. Yeah, like they, they, they built their inside. base and they stayed there stayed because there. they didn't want to get out and get killed. Yeah. So like, I think that's one of the reasons not reason. I think, yeah, I think that may may have played a part in the what's it called? The I hate using this term for like, uh, but like that played a part in like the kinetic activity in the area, um, because there was for sure a lot more uh, that was far more kinetic than, uh, with the exception of like the initial push into Sangin with one six. But um, other than that, it was I. The ANA just didn't have a presence in the area, especially for their local security patrols. So, which I think, honestly, I think that enabled the the what's it called the uh, the insurgent fighters to uh, to push their attacks. Yeah, and the, you also had a lot of foreign influence coming in there. And I remember a point where we heard some gunshots one time, and found out later on from intel or somebody that it was the local fighters, the local Taliban fighters fighting with the like dudes that were coming down from Pakistan. Cause these dudes would come in from Pakistan and stuff like that. And they're like, Hey, we're in charge. We're like the big dick players coming out of, you know, Taliban headquarters or whatever. <laughs> yeah. And they would show up and be like, Hey, you have to give us this compound and you, and the family here has to feed us and do this. And if you don't, we're going to kill you. Well, obviously the local fighters, some of yeah, those yeah. families were their families and they didn't like being pushed around. So there were times where the Taliban was fighting itself, which was kind of comical on its own. Um, but I don't know, man. It was just, I will say also that was, we, there was another firefight that we had gotten into. We were moving south from PB Cuba or yeah, we were moving south from PB Cuba and you know what I'm talking about when we the got, one, when we were going to that police station, uh, PB Omar, right? Was it Omar? I yeah. Think, yeah. It, where was. it was like, yeah, where it was like, I, and I, it was like game of Thrones where it kind of looked like that, like standards out like banners Oh and, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. They were getting. It was ready. actually a really nice building, dude. It was a really nice building. I remember because we, you and I, were sitting in the, uh, we were, you and I were like admiring that fucking that AKS, right? We were admiring that AKS, and then all of a sudden it was just like a fucking round snapped over our heads, and then we were like, oh shit! And then uh, things started. That was when that S was it the S six dude or S two dude? Their S two dude. Like, oh fucking, my god, I totally forgot about yeah, that. Yeah, holy, f he ran like ran there by himself and. <laughs> okay, so. 
what happened here was we were moving south from PB Cuba and on 611, on Route 611, we we're heading towards this PB Omar. Wait, was which that is when a, we also almost overturned one of the MRAPs? I don't remember that. Okay. I, I don't know if I was there for that. All right. That might have been like a, like a Pharaoh and I thing, but I remember, I think Captain Rose and I almost fucking. I think he saved it, but it was like a weird turn going up to Cuba from 611. Yeah, was Cuba kind of was up banked. that super steep yeah, hill. Yeah, and it would like bank to the side a little bit. But I think one of the bigger MRAPs almost turned over. And I remember thinking that if that happened, this was going to be a shit show. I, okay, so I kind of, I think I kind of remember that now because either after that incident, or maybe it was before that, they started making us dismount at the bottom of the hill. And we'd, and we'd walk, walk up while the driver and an A driver yeah. went up the hill because of the possibility of that happening. So we were moving south from PB Cuba, and they're like, hey, we're going to swing by PB Omar. The brigade commander is there. Um, the brigade commander is there, and we're going to just going to meet up with them and see what's going on. Well, on our way down, the map that I had been given, I was using my tablet, and the map I had been given showed that the PB was on the uh, west side of 611. And so we were heading down, and I'm like, hey, it should be up here on the right. And I, was, I believe I was in your truck. I want to say I was with you guys and Captain Falvey. And we were coming down. They're like, that doesn't make sense. We got a bunch of A and A guys on the left side, on the east side of the six eleven. So we're gonna pull in here and see what's going on. I'm like, all right, cool. So someone had yeah. mismat. Someone had mismarked the map data that they had given me. Turns out, had the building that I thought was the patrol base, had we turned in there, that's where the Taliban fighters. That was part of the area that the Taliban fighters were at. Yeah. So we pulled up, and there's basically this big firefight going on, and it and it was super abnormal because it, it was, a lot of times, you know, like you had talked about earlier with the murder holes, they would wait for a patrol to go by and then they will shoot a burst off and then run. You yeah. know, they wouldn't stay and fight because they knew we would drop bombs on them or something would happen and we'd yeah. kill them. This time, like we they, pulled up. They were in the tree line. We, yeah. had, we had the MSF there with us, which yeah. is another, another advisor team. And they had these like APCs with Mark 19s and 50 cals on top. And... We had mortars and we were had dishkas and we had our weapon systems. We got all these people and we're at this patrol base and the Taliban is actively just engaging. They're just engaging from the other side. Me and Emil were on some kind of platform. Yeah. I don't remember what that was, but we were on some kind of platform where we could see over the wall. We were trying to spot where the enemy locations were because we had guys in front of us, our own dudes in front of us that were going to be firing. Yeah. And him and I were sitting here. Suddenly, you know, rounds cracked overhead, yeah. and I think me and you rolled off of that we thing did it real quick. Fell on top of each other, and my radio was still up on top of it. So I reached up and grabbed it down, and I was talking on that. Um, but it was super weird. The MSF, the this APC pulled out into the green zone towards this tree line yeah. where these guys were fighting from. At the same time, I have a um, oh, that British aircraft tornado. I had a British tornado on station. I was working with him. And this is, like I said, it's a sustained firefight. You can't, I couldn't believe it was happening because it was going on for so long. And they were shooting RPGs at this MSF vehicle and they weren't falling back. Like the Taliban dudes were not falling back. They're staying in the tree line, continuing to fight, shooting RPGs to the point where that MSF, AP, you know, this armored vehicle is out there taking rounds and it just starts pulling back. So your armored vehicle is getting schwacked too much that they're pulling back. And I'm requesting air. I we see where the target is, and I'm trying to get a hellfire or brimstone is what the Brits call it's a their version of it a brimstone on the target there. And <clears throat> I just remember the battalion denying it, denying three, my four. request. <laughs> yeah, three four. Uh, I would go and say, it and I don't care that they were probably the worst people I've ever worked with out there. You know, um, you think so, they were quarterbacking it from the uh, ISR? What's that? You think they're they were quarterbacking it from? Oh, like the definitely, ISR? definitely. Well, and they, and you know the reasoning afterwards, they were like, uh, "Yeah, we just want to ensure that the Afghans were utilizing all their weapon systems uh, <laughs> before we allowed you to engage." And we're just like, I remember specifically after this minutes after we had gotten back, yeah, I uh, we had were back on the base and we were walking through, and the battalion commander, I ran into three fourths battalion commander, and he's like, "Oh, hey, you're the JTAC, right?" And I'm like, "Yes, sir." He's like. Yeah, man, you're about five minutes away from having that mission approved. <laughs> and when he said that to me, I was like, in my mind, I'm like, fuck you, bro. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm imagining me and you yeah. rolling off of shit, trying not to get shot, you know, and all this stuff happening. And at the same time, so imagine, imagine being a couple hundred yards away. There's RPGs flying. 
There's machine gun rounds flying. There's small arms flying. There's pandemonium amongst the Afghans somewhat, you know, of like, what the hell is happening? Yeah. And then out of nowhere, this S2 ANA guy, this dude was like a major or something yeah. in the ANA mm-hmm. army. And I'll let you tell this story. So he like, so imagine like he was uh, actually, everyone's a little bit bigger than me because I'm pretty short in stature, but he was like a taller ANA dude. Um, imagine someone, no helmet. Um, did he even have his no. body armor? No, yeah. he had no body armor, no, no helmet. He had one magazine. He had his AK in a magazine. <laughs> and then, so imagine this dude and then him fucking going off on his own to like, and it looked like to like assault the fucking Taliban position by himself. A f- frontal <laughs> assault through an exposed position because it was a field. <laughs> and I remember what, so he's running, he's running off to go do his thing. I remember Pellegrini and I'm pretty sure Wyatt like tried not they didn't go after him, but I think they were trying to help support like they I think they fired their own rounds as they were what's it called as that dude was moving towards him because they were like no one was fucking else was doing anything. Oh, yeah. They started laying down like some suppressive fire because this dude this dude was running and like he would be like he'd be running like hunched over and he'd get behind something to hop up and just start shooting rounds at the Taliban hunched down start running closer and we're we're all over here like 200 yards behind him. You know, and he's 200 yards away from the enemy. And we're like, what the fuck is, <laughs> what is this dude doing? doing? Dude? <laughs> yeah, that was. Uh, and then he ran back. And then like when he came back, he was strutting around like, yeah, yeah. yeah what's up? I was like, what the fuck? dude? <laughs> yeah, we were all like, dude. like yeah. I even said, I think I said to you or somebody at the time. I'm like, if that dude gets killed, yeah, we're I'm not, not even going to feel we, bad. No, I'll, I'll, like, the, what's, me, Short and White talked about. We're like, if that dude gets hit, we're not going up after him. Like, that, fuck that. dude. That's insane. Like what yeah. he was doing was insane. So. Also, because no, he didn't take any. It wasn't like it was like an established like fucking assault. It was just like I'm gonna go do whatever the fuck I want to do. Yeah, yeah. We had a pretty interesting deployment that third time in Sangin. I mean, you know, I thought it was. I remember. I think I remember one of the first times that you and I were in the back of your guys's truck, um, and we were cruising through, and you pointed out the building that you got blown up in. Yeah. So what was that like? And you may have saw it on your second deployment. So what was, was it like to see that place again for the first time? So the building had been like leveled. So they, I think they might've been like a week or two after. Uh, so building two eight, we got blown up uh, February 14th. And then February 22nd, uh, Corporal Taylor, who was with us, he ended up dying in that building. But on like, I get, I'm pretty sure it was like the opposite side of that building. So after that. Which, oh, they went back they went to back the building? To for um, what I, who knows? Right? I have no idea. So that's like part of it. Like I have no idea why they, they went back a third time. But uh, so they went back a third time. And he ended up passing away from his injuries. Um, so they leveled the building after that. Okay. Um, so I remember passing it and seeing it and just knowing like we passed a moo and then it was basically fucking you know like five hundred meters to the east um, from Amu in the brown zone. So I knew exactly where that was. For me. Honestly, it really wasn't like I wasn't like fucking sweating, nothing like that. It was more of just like a, I don't know, it was like surreal or kind of sur- like kind of surreal. Amu was a little bit, Amu was, uh, they kind of tore down Amu compared to what I, what it was like when I was there. Yeah. And, they were pulling a lot of the bases out yeah, when we moved in. They were like demilling most of them. So like for me, like looking at, it was more of like a, almost, I want to say like a poignant reminder, but it was just like fucking kind of noted it and then that was pretty much it like it was there wasn't I maybe mean, it would it would have been different had they not leveled it because then i would have been like yeah that's you know that's where we fucking uh that's the hole we tried to breach through and yeah we got blown up so yeah so <clears throat> all right now that um you know i think our, our I've always told people our deployment was my favorite, I, you know, out of the five deployments I did, our deployment was my favorite one. It was the scaredest I've ever been in my life. Yeah. It was the like probably most hungry I've ever been in my life because <laughs> we were all starving out there. Yeah. Like we were, we were the most happy people when our Afghan partners would be like, Hey, you guys want lunch? We're all like, fuck yeah. yeah. Like, Oh <laughs> the shit. Rice. They're bringing out rice. Yeah, rice. Oh yes. <laughs> and French fries. They're French fries. Um, so that deployment, I think, I felt like we actually did something, you know, like, you, you, I don't know. It just seemed like we were doing something that was decent. And I don't know, man. For me, it was just a just a really good deployment compared to my other ones. I, I was more active. I did more of my job on that deployment. And yeah. 
I mean, we were dropping mortars and stuff and everything like pretty, pretty Afghan mortars because three, four wouldn't approve Drum anything marks. for us. So, <laughs> yeah. uh, Afghan mortars, but that was still cool. It was effective. We made it work. Yeah. Um, so having done three deployments to Sangin, which is just crazy saying like that, uh, you come back, you come back from our deployment what, what made you decide to get out of the military? How long, uh, how long after we got back, did you get out? I was like, cause well, we got back in August of 13. Yeah. Like August I got 1st. out October of 2014. So I had like a year, um, our, yeah, a little over a year. And then so the – I had – in my mind, I contemplated staying in. So part of it was like I, I kind of like talked myself into like being like, hey, like if I stay in, I kind of want to get orders overseas, uh, which like would be like at a like a naval clinic or something like that. Um, And it just – I don't know. It just didn't work out the way I wanted it to. Like there were openings for like Saganella Sicily, Naples – there were orders for like Germany, um, but it just, I mean, even I would fucking, I even fucking applied for orders for like Cuba or Guam, um, not Cuba, Jesus Christ, <laughs> totally. Well, I mean, we have people in Cuba. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, I think I was thinking of like Guantan- uh, Guantanamo Bay and uh, Guam, but those are, they just start with the letter G. Yeah. Um, no, so I applied for orders and fucking went through three different rounds of orders to try to pick it and it just... None of it ever lined up. I tried to talk to my detailer. I kind of even did like the the scumbag, like, hey, dude, like I've been in for fucking literally five years. I did three combat deployments. I have a Purple Heart, two fucking NAMs, both with Vs. Like, please give me orders overseas. And the dude was like, he was literally word for word was like, I'm sorry, man, that's not how it works. I was like, <laughs> All right, Isn't, that crazy? Well, like, Isn't yeah. that crazy how... That's one of my biggest gripes with the military is that you can do so much for the military, but they don't... You think you think that at some point it matters. You know what I'm saying? Like that. Yeah. Like my experience and my my own sacrifices yeah. would be thought about. You know, at maybe obviously not at the big Marine Corps level because that's all. You know, you're you're just a number yeah, exactly. on a line. But at your own unit or at your like lower level units, you would yeah. think that they would give you a little bit more consideration because of the things you've done. Especially when you look at other people, yeah. and you're like, okay. So the, I think the I think the tough part for the uh, not for like the detail or like our detailer or something like that. I think for, I think it was just kind of like a different, it was like a different, not a different, I think, yeah, I think, I think to say like it started to change as far as like the dynamics and like an infantry, the dynamics at 2 8 when I first got to 2 8 and then when I got out was like night and day. Like it was not the same. Like, um, the op tempo wasn't the same. The things that, there were like little things that, they used to harp on us for like, obviously like not having your hands in your pockets or fucking, you know, like making sure your uniform square haircuts, but that like became like a, it became like a real, it became like a real part of the Marine Corps right before I got out, at least for like at, at two, eight, so Compa- it became like a more garrison, you know, yes. like, which, you know, there's people that'll argue that it's the little things that are, uh, overall, you know, help the Marine Corps. Like, you know, the discipline to not put your hands in your pockets. I'm not one of those people. I will argue yeah. against anybody that says that. I think there are, started, but... I think there are certain things well, when it comes to like the discipline thing. I do like think like little things matter, but I think that fucking putting your hands in your pocket is not one of them. Yeah. We have a real problem nowadays focusing on, we're more concerned about, um, how we look, the appearance of the unit, the appearance of the military than we are about the performance. You know, it's more, Hey, this guy looks really good on paper, but is he is he going to be any good in combat? Like, I don't know because we don't go to ranges because we have to do harp classes or we have to do yeah. or not harp uh, whatever sapper classes. You know, it's like the the focus has changed definitely because we have more time on our hands and I don't know. But all right, so you decided to get out. Uh, what do you do now? Okay, so now I work as an EMT, um, kind of like doing that gig, trying to really. See if that's something I want to do or like stay doing. Um, how long? How long have you been working as an EMT? A little over like a year. Okay. So, um, so I'm trying to figure out if that's something I want to do. It's honestly not bad. I enjoy doing it. It's just obviously if I try to compare it to the Sangha Valley, it's not going to be good for me. So I try to, I try to keep my mind open as far as like obvious. I still one of the cooler things about doing that is there's a lot more. Uh, it's actual like medical calls, right? So Afghanistan was mostly trauma. I wasn't dealing with like heart attacks or 
you know, like overdoses or anything like that, like that Afghanistan was straight up trauma. I, didn't, I don't think I dealt with a single like real like medical emergency outside of trauma in Afghanistan. How many, so for the overdoses, like what, how does that look as an EMT? Cause everybody always hears about the opioid crisis and like stuff like that. But I don't think people actually, people outside of the medical community or people that, are, you know, the police community or the direct families that are directly affected by it. I don't think they really realize, uh, the extent of the, the issue. So what would you say percentage wise, uh, your calls that you've gone on were, you know, overdoses. So like here, so because I'm not a paramedic, um, most of them will be, and unless I'm like in a Vic with, with a paramedic, most of them I'll be transporting. But from what I understand when it comes to the opioid crisis, which is the, the, the big one here in, uh, in the States, especially like, like we talked about, like in the East, in the East coast and like the Midwest, it's a fucking legitimate problem. Um, I think it's a legitimate problem everywhere. Um, and then most of this isn't like, most of these are like over, not over the counter, but like prescription medications. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, so I think a lot of, obviously like this, this is where like you'll get most of your, uh, younger overdoses. Um, when you're in the the bigger cities, it might be a little bit different. Uh, but in the East Bay, there's a decent amount of uh, overdoses, which could be any number of them. So, as far as like heroin or uh, prescription, prescription, um, a lot of uh, there are a lot. Obviously, there are a lot more medical calls than trauma calls, um, which obviously it's. Afghanistan is just hyper focused with trauma just because it's uh, yeah it's a combat it's a, it's a war zone <laughs> so yeah so you've been out for five years almost now what would you what advice would you give to somebody that's that's getting ready to transition or what would you say to somebody that is having a hard time transitioning like they're out they're out maybe so, less than a year and they're having an issue I I had this issue getting out as far as like my big thing was uh, I mean you remember me when I was fucking. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like the most disgruntled person on the planet. Um, uh, and I think like one of the reasons I'm, I got better and I, I am getting better as far as like dealing with being out in this film world is that I'm not trying to like still be this like war fighting doc. Right. I understand like that was what I needed to be at the time and like where I needed to be. But like, I understand that there are other things, um, there are other things I can do that uh, there are other. All right. So like, how do I put it this? That, that, that was like a chapter in my life, but it's not like what, it's not the only thing I can be. Right. And I think yeah. uh, so part of it too, is that like, when I got out, I was like, you know, all my Marines aren't here. You know, my friends aren't here. Like if I think as, as veterans, we kind of, we kind of like fuck ourselves and sure ourselves like in the foot when it comes to like the whole like wartime thing. Cause we're like, unless you like, you went to war, like you can't understand what I've been through type of shit. And that's, I think that's completely fucking false. Um, I think you can draw parallels to fucking anything. And that if you go out there with that fucking, you know, that closeted mindset where you're like, uh, unless you went to war, you can't understand what I'm going through. With that being said, like, why the fuck would you want someone to understand that, right? Why yeah. would you want someone to care about you to be like, do you want to understand what it's like to fucking, you know, watch your friend lose both his legs? Fuck no, dude. Like, don't be a dick, right? Like, be a good person, live a good life. Like, you don't have to, you don't have to make people understand, like, what it's like to go to war. So you're saying that it's more like, as a veteran, as somebody that's out, you got to expand your network. You can't yeah. just hang out with other veterans. The, like, you can't. Exactly. Like, you can't. If if your <laughs> if your whole goal of getting out in the military is to hang out with other people from the military, you should have never gotten out of the military. <laughs> yeah, you know. So like, yeah. it's kind of like weird where it's like, yeah. I, but the thing is, is like, is it refreshing to hang out with like your buddies from the military and then like see other people from the military? Fuck yeah, dude. But at the end of the day, like, I'm not gonna go out of my way and just like the only people I hang out with are veterans or like the military, other like military dudes. Because at the end of the day, I limit my I limit my horizons and I limit what's it called, like the circle I keep by doing that. All right? Exactly, and I think I think that's one of my the biggest lessons. So I've been out for exactly one year today. I think actually is my congrats. Yeah, congrats. The twenty first. We'll, we'll grab that's some my, drinks. Uh, one year EAS date. Um, um, I think that's one of my biggest things that I would tell guys is to start now 
making your network. Yeah. And that then you're going to start that network through LinkedIn or through yeah. Facebook or well, whatever. Like, so with, like, you're going to start with veterans. Yeah. But you have to be able to reach out. If you meet someone in like a professional environment or it's someone that's semi-professional, give them your LinkedIn. Tell them to match with or link with you on on their LinkedIn with or whatever it's called. Link up on LinkedIn or one of these other networking sites because, I mean, that's how you succeed in life. Yeah. It's all about – it's not necessarily what you bring to the table. It's what you bring to the table and what – someone else inviting you to the table. You know what I'm saying? You got to get yeah. that invitation to the table. And the only way to do that is it's not just through a resume. It's not just through um, going to interviews. It's networking. A lot of jobs and stuff are found through just having a conversation with somebody and telling them like what you can do and what you can't do. And that gives them, that gives people a realistic perspective of who you are because in an interview, you're trying to be the best person that you are yeah. and you may, may not be that person that you're, proclaiming to be there. So <laughs> yeah. I think it's easier for professionals to see you in a um, s- semi-formal or informal environment as a normal person. And especially yeah. as a veteran, because everyone has that stigma that, you know, everyone has PTSD and everybody's about to pop off at some point, yeah, which is, which, which is completely is. false. And it's driven mostly, I think it's driven by people that falsely claim PTSD um, for various things, try to use it to get out of stuff like that. Um, and, or people jumping to the conclusion that he must've done this because he has PTSD <laughs> <laughs> and and I've seen that, so I, yeah. I I definitely think networking is probably one of the most important things you can do before you get out and during your transition. Like yeah. every professional you meet in TRS and stuff like that, get a business card, add them on LinkedIn. Yeah, you know, I think like for at least for me, like uh, for especially like with the idea of like networking, having hobbies and actually doing things is which sounds so fucking simple and like actually honestly really sounds really dumb but that's such a simple thing to do is like have a hobby and have fucking friends with people like so yeah. like one of the things for like I, either jujitsu or wrestling like so have a hobby that's physically active stay physically active and then uh fucking don't close yourself off to like the world hobbies are ho- you're, you're right man hobbies are definitely important because i think so many guys especially your guys that were um, combat arms and did like the cool stuff or whatever you want to call it in the military. You're never going to see that again. You're never yeah. going to replicate and that. And you can't use it. Uh, yeah. You can't. So like, that was one of the best advices I've ever got or the best advice I've ever got in the military is like, you can't use your military experience, especially if you've been through combat, you can't use that as like your, your example of like what you're expecting when you pick a job or you like, you know, or try to do something else. Like if yeah. you try to look for that peak every single time, you're not going to find it. Yeah. If that's you, then just go be a contractor. Yeah. Like if you decided to get out and like, that's the life you want to live, then go be a contractor because honestly you're just, you're not going to make it in the real world. Yeah, like it's going to be, you rough. know, cause you're always, it's never going to be there. That, that thrill, that excitement that you've, the scaredness, you know, the fear yeah. is never going to be there. Like it was when you were in a active combat situation. So I think, that's great advice is definitely have a hobby and within your network, have a good network of veterans and civilians and people that you can talk to. Yeah. And, um, yeah, don't be a dick. Don't be a fucking dick. That's like so. probably the best advice is like literally just don't be a dick. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, we've been going for a little while. Um, I think we, this is probably a good spot to cut it off. Yeah. Do you want to drop your Instagram or anything like that? Or do you want to <laughs> shout out any, like your wrestling or, uh, your I gyms? mean like, so if, Obviously, like, veteran community, I'm obviously super open to. Uh, if you guys are ever, like, in, the, like, the San Francisco Bay Area and you guys want to get a role in it, whether or not you guys do jiu-jitsu or wrestle, um, you guys can hit me up on Instagram. I would give out my phone number, but that, I feel like that's pretty sketch on the internet. Yeah, don't do that. So, uh, <laughs> what's it called? Hit me up on Instagram. Super easy. It's Pocket Doc. So, the word pocket and doc put together and then 007. Um. So that's super easy. Uh, we have like a wrestling club slash jujitsu club that we all fucking roll at. So I'm the only veteran currently, but obviously it's open to anyone. So yeah, yeah if you guys are ever up here, you know, hit us up. We'll fucking roll or something. Grab some beers after. Awesome, man. Well, thanks for uh, thanks for the interview. You're the first interview. Yeah, uh, hopefully, hopefully first of many. Yeah. Um, and uh, good luck to you in your future. I'm glad I got to come up here and see you. It's been I don't think because I deployed again not long yeah. after we got back. Um, 
I haven't seen you since almost right after we got back. So this is well, oh no 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 2000, 2000, we saw each other two thousand fifteen. I did briefly for yeah like, we like an hour an we hour. saw each other. Yeah. So I I took advantage. I came to San Francisco and I, I made sure to hit him up. So it was good seeing you and uh, good talking to you. Yeah. All right. I mean, take it easy, bro. Later. All right. Another episode of the former Action Guys podcast in the books. That was my interview with Camino Emil. I appreciate him having him on and him telling the story because, you know, he's he's done some interesting stuff that it just kind of boggles my mind that he continued to go back and do more and more of it. Um, next week, I'm going to have on my friend who's a JTAC. He was with 10th Marines. His name's Chris Lindbergh. He uh, did a few deployments, and he's got quite a few stories to tell from everything from being a JTAC to doing uh, civil affairs and stuff like that. So next week, episode three of the Former Action Guys podcast will feature him. Till then, if you have any questions, remarks, comments, anything you want to shoot me over, some uh, whatever, just not any spam links, uh, Former Action Guys podcast at gmail.com. Again, that's Former Action Guys podcast at gmail.com. Make sure to check out my Instagram page, J. Kramer Graphics, and my website, jkramergraphics.com. All right, thanks. See you guys next week.